Okay, so we're back. We're going to do the second half of chapter one, the technical overview. And, and actually, this will be the technical part. We've gotten through the motivation, the significance, the whys, and the histories of X3D. Now we're going to do race through the different parts of what are the functional components here. Okay, first term is uh, browsers. X3D browsers, what are they? Those are the softwares that read us X3D scene and draw. We sometimes call these guys viewers. And that's because the term browser comes from, it usually plugs into the web browser. And so your web browser now has a third dimension capability to it. But it turns out these pieces of software can be plugged into lots of different things as standalone applications, as an embedded part of a different application, you name it. So browsers, viewers, all right? Keywords there are parsing. Parsing means reading the scene and then rendering, which is the 3D term for drawing, portraying what's going on, okay? Now X3D goes beyond uh, just uh, 3D scenes, we can also do simulation. We can animate, we can do user interaction, let the, let the user control what's going on. Okay, so if you want to get any of these, we maintain on the resources page this list of applications. And click there, we can see, oh, there it is, the resources page. <coughs> this should look pretty darn familiar in one of the back appendices of the book. It just has a different name. We used to call it X3D help page. The help page, uh, we said maybe that name's not as good as it's really a listing of resources. So most of these things are in there in the book, but if barely a day goes by where we're not adding some improvement to the X3D resources page. One notable one, uh, just in the last two weeks at SIGGRAPH. It used to be that we have one very good browser for uh, Macs, and that is uh, Free World by CRC. Uh, in fact, that's even on the Apple website. But as it turns out now, uh, the uh, first five browsers on here run on Macs and indeed Linux too. Uh, so three commercial browsers and uh, a couple of open source browsers. And then there are some uh, other things too. Okay, so the list keeps getting uh, uh, broader and deeper as time goes on. Lots of resources. Okay. Uh, when it's a plugin, that means you can just link it inside your web page as an embedded applet or as a uh, viewed thing. Here are the three primary uh, browsers today, August 2008, and you can get a lot of these plugins to work with each. And here's a longer list of all of those, again, from the resources page, list of application. And we take advantage of these uh, inside our authoring tool, if you want. Okay, what else? The uh, next thing I'm going to show you is a picture showing a generic software architecture. That's probably a red flag for some of you. Whenever you hear generic software architecture, you can often hear that, oh, well, nobody's actually implemented that, or there's something there for everybody to disagree with, so they hid those parts. Well, maybe that's true, but the, the motivation for a generic diagram, a basic diagram of how it might work, is we want to allow software implementers to be as high performance as they possibly can, to be as capable and as effective as they can. So they have different ways of writing their software. So we do not lock them into a certain way of writing their code. Rather, we say the end results must be the same. So this gives our, our software folks freedom, uh, freedom to implement. It gives our end users freedom to choose which they like the best. And it means the responsibility is a little lighter. We don't have to get down to every detail on the specification, but rather say basically how this works 
how does this work? And then uh, that's the information we share. So let's look at that diagram. Uh, pretty straightforward, really. The, the heart of it would be that you have a scene graph manager, meaning something that is drawing to the screen and taking advantage of 3D nodes. And then we just have different ways of doing input, meaning you could read any of these files to get in there. We can use both the native and prototype, meaning newly invented nodes, author invented nodes in 3D. It's not just about file reading. We also have code, script code that authors can write. You may recall the honeycomb diagram show that the functionality of the encodings, the file formats, matches the functionality of the APIs. Well, here we are again, uh, scene access interface. This would be author written code that can augment the built-in capabilities. Okay. And then finally, we have uh, the ability to interact right with the web browser and pass events back and forth, just like you can do today with JavaScript in HTML. OK, so there's our generic diagram that lists the basic pieces, parts, and who talks to whom. The details are left, again, up to the software implementers. So what does this mean, really? Well. If we say, okay, we don't have to worry about the software, let's worry about the model, then the next key term is scene graph. The scene graph is the construct where we put all these things together. Uh, many of them similar, some quite different. Okay, so first of all, it's a, it's a graph in the mathematical sense, directed meaning it has a top and a bottom parent-child relationships, Acyclic, meaning you can't have a cycle, an infinite loop in the structure. This constrains the mathematical construct here of a graph. So there is a root, and there are no loops. You go, oh, wait a minute. That matches XML, XML document structure, too. Oh, so that's a good fit. What else is it? Well, it's declarative. And this is in direct contrast to a lot of different 3D application programming interfaces, at least a lot of the way people tend to learn it, say in uh, DirectX or uh, OpenGL or other coding APIs, they're often imperative, meaning you're writing out steps that say, well, first I'll make a list of triangles, and then I will uh, calculate the colors for each, and then I will translate them around, and then I will uh, push it down to the hardware, and there's very explicit cookbook instructions on, on what's happening at any given time. We would call that imperative. Imperative. But instead, we are declarative, meaning, well, there's going to be a chair here and a light over there. And we might want to look at it from this perspective, or we might want to look at it there. So we'll let the user decide that. We'll put, we'll put these things in the scene and uh, Software, you go take care of that stuff. I just want to define my world model on its terms rather than express it in terms of how the code works. Okay? So this is what we mean by declarative. That's very similar to computer-aided design models, CAD models. Uh, they're simpler. They describe the functionality, not the step-by-step how-to. A little more uh, terminology. It's always good to get your vocabulary down. As you uh, practice it, as you repeat it, you internalize it, and the concepts become easier to follow and, and uh, easier to grow upon. So we're distinguishing here between data files that can capture a model, including its behavioral relationships, the viewer, sometimes called the player, sometimes called the plugin sometimes called the browser, that reads that scene graph data file and portrays it, renders it, draws it on the screen. The editor is what we would use to create these things. And the application would be either that freeform browser that can load a model, or maybe some highly tuned pieces of software that have specific purposes and are reading X3D models in to do what they care about. 
Okay, rendering, rendering. How do we do it in X3D? Well, scene graphs are a technology that have actually been around for uh, a good long time, over 15 years. And uh, so they're pretty well understood. The basic idea is this graph structure is traversed, meaning they walk the tree, all the parts that are active on every frame rate. So what the computer is doing is it's drawing a picture. And as it walks this tree, it says, okay, this is going to go here, that's going to go there, what's my point of view, all right, this is obscuring another thing, so I'll just draw it over. It does that one, and once it's finished constructing that picture, it swaps it out with the picture that was already on the frame. This is what we mean by double buffering, so that you're never drawing directly to the screen, but rather only a completed image goes in front of the user on the screen. And meanwhile, while that completed image is there, we're drawing the next one. When it's done, okay, it's in place, and we start working on the next. Okay, so while it may look to you, watching these images getting flipped up there as if things are changing all the time, in reality, they're changing one at a time for what you see. And it's only a finished image that gets put up. And the fact that they're very fast and only slightly different from the next is what makes it appear to you as if something inside of that is moving. So being fast, of course, is the key to that looking natural, looking intuitive, looking real time. What is real time? Well, the human perception of smooth motion is roughly 7 to 10 uh, frames per second, 7 to 10 images per second. Okay, if it's slower than that, you can tell. You can say, that looks jerky. Okay, so you want to go faster than that. Uh, this is what 3D is all about. Back in the day, that used to be pretty hard to maintain. Uh, but nowadays, with hardware getting better, we can, uh, we can maintain that pretty well. Rendering, again, is the drawing. Offline rendering is when you say, well, maybe the picture is so complicated, oh, I can't maintain it in real time, very fast updates, because I want to have really precise, really brilliant realism. So offline rendering might say, OK, we'll take a second or five seconds, or however long it takes to do that one image. Offline rendering is often done for uh, movies and other really high performance, high, super high quality things. And in fact, you hear about render farms. A, a, farm, a render farm is just clusters, just piles of computers, big room full of them, sucking down power and running all day and all night. And all they're doing is crunching one image at a time and putting them back in the database so that the images can be rendered, played out as a full-scale movie. Because those are so expensive and so slow, movie artists are often using simpler versions of their characters so they, they can really interact with it, get it just right, and then you know push render farm button before they go home for the night and they come back in the morning and they can see what does it look like in super high quality compared to the regular quality they were used to. So we still care about performance, it still matters, but things are getting better all the time. Okay, optimizations. Optimization is a big part of design, how we get things to work. And uh, because scene graphs are so well understood, because they've been carefully designed, there are a lot of optimizations to help speed up that rendering process that are built in. A lot of those are exposed to uh, authors. Okay, so we'll see that uh, uh, we can take advantage of some of that by using uh, a term called def and use, where we might identify a construct by a name, and it could be pretty complicated, and then if we want to use it again later in the scene, all we have to do is not recreate the whole thing, but just say, put in a placeholder to it. Use this guy. Use this guy again. Use it a third or fourth time. And the graphics hardware is able to say, okay, I'm walking through my scene graph. 
I'm traversing, and then when I get use, I just put a copy there, use, copy by reference there, etc. So this is the kind of performance techniques that we do. Browsers can do other things under the hood, even though you might arrange your scene graph in a certain way. There are analytic techniques that can be used to say, well, that order doesn't matter, so I'll draw one first before the other because it will go faster. Okay. So uh, those details are what, uh, what all of the spec wants, all of the software implementators like to, uh, implementers like to work on. What is the scene graph relative to this lower level imperative programming? Well, it's easier. It takes less time, a lot less time to learn. You don't have to be a, a coding super guru. And uh, I think uh, you, could, you could get boggled down into quite a long laundry list of technical details. If we pop up to the end and you just say, well, it's, it's easier because it makes more sense. It tends to be a lot closer to the model behavior that you're trying to simulate rather than can I properly express code in a way the computer will understand? What's another comparison? Ray tracing is another, uh, I won't say widely used, but well-known uh, computer technique. And ray tracing gets even closer to can we emulate the physical properties of lights, meaning the physics equations in all of their intensely detailed glory. Uh, here's a nice exercise. Next time you're in a, in a college bookstore, go, uh, go look at uh, the biggest book on graphics you can find. There are several, a lot bigger than, than, than this one. Uh, and then go look at the biggest book on optics you can find. And so you might find a graphics book would be about that thick. And then you'll find the physics book, and it'll be thicker. And it will also say something like, Mm, volume one of four. Okay, so if we look at the physics of light and how things work and how, how, how reality is, we can see pretty quickly that graphics is a simplification of that where we're trying to emulate real world, but we have to carefully reduce the complexity of many things if we want to be real time. Ray tracing is somewhere in the middle. It's closer to how is the physics of light? Where is the light ray going? Where is the photon bouncing, reflecting again and again, and diffusing, attenuating, changing uh, as it goes? So because those techniques are more visually realistic, they make nicer pictures. But because the computations are harder and often not predictable, how many bounces will a light ray take before it's done in a scene, we can't always figure out in advance whether or not uh, ray tracing will finish uh, in a predictable period of time. So that's why this still does still tend to be uh, faster. Uh, or, or that's why it tends to be slower than the interactive techniques. It's, it's worth uh, uh, pointing out, though, that there's nothing particularly blocking ray tracing techniques from being used with, graph, with scene graphs and with X3D. And uh, I list one tool here, outstanding uh, company, Okino, they're the best uh, translator company from one format to another. They have a, a, a ray tracing capability. And in SIGGRAPH this year, there was actually uh, entire sessions on real-time ray tracing two terms, real-time and ray tracing, that historically have not been used in the same sentence together. But now people are figuring out ways to continue optimizing and get some of these techniques into hardware so that they might work. Okay, so that's ray tracing. What other scene graphs are there? Well, there are lots. I've listed a bunch of them here, along with uh, their logos, wherever I could find them. And, uh, they're quite uh, similar in many respects. There are others out there, but you can look at these other things and uh, find uh, uh, good exemplars. If you're familiar with any of them, you probably will find X3D to be quite familiar too. 
Right, next set of technical terms it would be behavior. Behavior. And behavior is one of those kind of uh, abstract or big picture terms that could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Well, how did your kids behave today? Just that question is, yeah, let's not answer that one. Uh, instead, let's say for scene graphs, behaviors can be defined very simply. Any value in your scene graph, wherever it is, if you change that, we'll call that a behavior. So it might be simple, like we changed the shade of color on something. We made it a little more red. Or we moved it from one place or rotated it. Any one of those small atomic operations could be considered a behavior. The power of this is important because the mechanics are pretty straightforward. You know, we have a scene graph that describes a model, and if we reach in and touch one, we send an event to, to modify it, then okay, you know, a route is the thing that carries it, the value goes there, it changes. We say, all right, we just changed something. But if you if we then ask the question, what is the expressive power? of a behavior. How much can you do with it? Well, if we can draw just about anything with a scene graph, and our event can change just about anything in a scene graph, then we can animate anything in a scene graph. We can modify the scene, we can change it over time so it looks like whatever we want. So this one simple mechanism of event passing Behaviors that modify the scene graph means we have complete and consistent flexibility in anything we do. And that means our animation is uh, quite powerful and quite simple because it all reduces to I'm um, changing values in the scene graph at runtime, and that is what affects my drawing change. Okay, so if our first pass on a scene graph, listing geometry and colors and images and locations and orientations is our primary thought about the scene graph. We could say, you know, that's a tree just by itself, but I guess there's another tree in there that describes what are our event sources and filters and modifiers and the routes that connect them. So there's, it's sort of like we've got two graphs, two mathematical graphs meshed together into one composite, one scene graph. Closely interrelated, the behaviors modify what's being drawn, the things being drawn reflect the changing behaviors of what's going on. So pretty straightforward. So although this jargon on the first or second pass might look a little imposing, the good news is it's consistent throughout. And once you learn it, it works all the way through. So as a result, we can say, well, there's, there are patterns here. There are uh, techniques that get repeated over and over and over, no matter what we're trying to animate. So here's an example one, and uh, I call this a design pattern, a common design that we find ourselves using again and again. So the idea would be the user decides to do something to start off the behavior chain, and we'll call that a trigger. And it's dotted here because we might not need a user. We might just say, oh, this will start up automatically, or it will wait 10 seconds and then, then get kicked off. And then we'll have a clock that governs the procedure, how this proceeds over time. And this interpolator or sequence, sequencer produces an event, produces a value that then gets sent to some node, the target node. And this is how we can change anything in the scene graph and Come on, you. Change anything in the scene graph and uh, have it vary over time. Okay, what's next? Well, file structure. Since our scene graph is written out to a file, even the embedded behaviors within it, we need some structure so it can be properly read. So here it is. We usually start off with what kind of X3D file is it? 
we have three different encodings. Then we have a header in there, which gives uh, information about what do you need to do to run this scene. Profiles and components are, as we'll see, they, they describe what's the possible level of complexity here. Meta statements are informational. Then we have the root of the scene, basically the top of what's being drawn, and then we have all the scene graph. Okay, so most of the course, most of learning X3D is all about that. And the top boilerplate, top overhead, just gets us going on how it works. What else can we say about X3D? Well, because it's big and at face value pretty complicated, we need to have some structure in there. So we've been very careful to maintain that. We want it to work both simply for basic scenes, for, for newcomers to the language, and work with sufficient expressive power for even the most advanced simulations. Okay, we think we've got it both ways. This plays out on a number, number of themes. If it's going to run over the web, it can't be too fast. It can't be so heavy that people won't wait for uh, a giant download to come. So we have to make important trade-offs as we go along. Can we do it quickly and cheaply, yet well enough, sufficiently high quality? Okay. So uh, we believe we've achieved that, and, and there are many examples to help show it. Next piece, because we are trying to play high-low, have tons of functionality if you need it, but simple functionality if that's all you want, we came up with the notion of profiles and components. And this is where we can subdivide all the functionality into different chunks so that software could adaptively load just the pieces that you need. So the profiles are the most common Oops, let's see if the eraser works here. Okay. Profiles are the most common usages of X3D. So there's only about, there's only a handful of profiles. Uh, we'll see them in a minute, but they go from the, the most basic interchange nodes up to adding a little interactivity up to what we call immersive, or the verbal, pretty close to verbal 97, where you've got plenty of behaviors. And then finally, to full, which is everything. Okay? If you want to get in between those four main levels, then you use components, and you can define for the software, at the head of the file, you can tell it, this is how good of a piece of software I need you to be. This is how much of X3D I might use. This is my design palette that I will stay inside of. Okay, so this is uh, part of how we get both heavy and light. So here's the picture describing that. We uh, sometimes call this the uh, the onion diagram, the layers of the onion here, because the different profiles are mostly uh, subsets or supersets of each other. Uh, the CAD profile is sort of a variation on a theme of interactive, where people are interchanging models of, of a different sort. But basically it goes from small to large, to larger, to extra super giant large, everything in the book. Okay, so I'll pick one. And since this is well defined, you usually don't even have to pick one. Our tools will figure it out for you and put that in the scene. And that lets them be quickly loaded by the software. Okay, next section of the this, this scene file were the meta statements, and they provide information. The name here comes from metadata, data about data. It, it's a document description. You know, a good analogy might be if you're in a uh, word processing tool and you go to properties, It'll have things for you to fill in, like my name is, and I work at, and my phone number, and my email, and blah, blah, blah. And this document is about such and such. Okay, we've got all that. But rather than be creative or unusual about it, we simply said, hey, uh, it works pretty well in HTML. 
Not that everybody does it, but HTML has mechanisms for this already. Let's just adopt that. So we did. So those meta tags are in there. They're well understood. Because they're the same as HTML, they're quite repeatable, and people don't have to uh, figure it out, but just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. Okay, so here's some actual uh, jargon then, some XML that uh, makes it work. And uh, we can see that we have different XML headers on there, and then a head statement and components. This is where the profiles come in. Profile gives us the basic level. Component might add some pieces to it. And all the boilerplate up at the top that we might use. And uh, down below is where the actual work gets done. Here's where our X3D is. So this is usually where we're paying attention to. And this is set up for us needs to be in the scene so that it can be properly and quickly loaded. Okay, so what else? We do have, remember, multiple file encodings. It's not just the XML. But here's what it looks like in the classic VRML. The same syntax as virtual reality modeling language 97. The first difference is the version, whereas Vermal was 2.0, X3D is version 3.0, or 3.1, or 3.2. The same constructs here, just a different syntax, just a different way of writing it out, the exact same functionality. Okay, in the book, you'll see us stick almost exclusively to the XML syntax, since web authors best understand that, but we will put side by side the corresponding verbal syntax when it makes sense. And then how much metadata do you need in a scene? Well, some people would say the more the merrier. You can't have too much metadata. It's sort of like, you know, uh, you can't be too rich or too thin or you fill in the blank. Uh, can you have too much metadata? Well, maybe not on the receiver end. It is a little bit of a pain on the delivery end, though. So we prompt you here. And the main thing to do with all of these in our example scene is delete them. Stick in the ones you want, the ones that matter. Make sure that somebody can pick up your scene later and still use it. That, that somebody might be you three or 10 or 20 months from now. But then get rid of the rest. It's much easier to strip out extra things than it is to try to invent the entries you need in the first place. OK, here's that same scene, same blank default scene to get you started, printed out as a pretty print HTML. So the color coding can help you understand it. We also see then uh, some of the comments and links in here. If you'd like to learn more about metadata and how people on the web do business, we've listed a bunch of helpful references here that can uh, get you going in that regard. Do you need to know all that stuff to start? No, no, you just get going. Okay, now we're going to get a little more computer science -y, more language lawyer about things. And uh, when we do pass around this data in the scene graph, when we define the parts of a model, we send events to change them, we have to carefully control what are the data types that go in here. So we call X3D a strongly typed language. Each value must be a Boolean, true, false, or an integer, negative 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, or a floating point number. They might also be arrays. And our, our nomenclature for that, our syntax is pretty goofy, I guess. Single field, multi field. It started that way in the beginning. Here's a good example of how it's important to get it right, or you might have to live with it. The main takeaway on data types is it must match or it's an error. And if you don't match, that error will stop you. Your scene won't work anymore. It will throw an error and, and tell you 
frankly, that's a good thing, because the worst error is not the error you see, it's the error you don't see. So other languages are not as strict as X3D. Many of them are less strict. We've chosen the strict approach because we want the simulation to do what you want.